everyone here, but uh, my name is Laura Boudreau. I'm the um, head of programming and publicity here at the library. Um, just a couple of things before we get started. Um, the um, validation over here, don't take, when you come to a program here, don't take a ticket in the garage. Just come here, put in your license plate number, and click save. It's good for three hours. Um, I did put some evaluate, evaluations on your chair. Um, we, do, we do read those, so if you could fill those out afterwards, that would be great. I do read each and every one of them. Um, it allows us to know what we're doing right at the library, what else we can be doing better, that sort of thing. Um, and so I'm just gonna give a quick introduction to Owen, Owen Egan. Um, probate Judge Owen Egan proudly serves the town of West Hartford as judge of the probate court. A lifelong West Hartford resident, Owen founded the local law firm Egan Donahue Van Dyke and Falsey LLP, where he has practiced for 29 years primarily in the areas of probate, estate planning, wills, trusts, conservatorships, real estate, and litigation. Owen received his undergraduate from Wesleyan University and his law degree from the Georgetown University Law Center. And here's Owen. Okay. Thank you very much, Moore. I'm going to use the podium. <laughs> Good evening and, and welcome. Uh, thank you all for coming. You're in for a, a real treat. This is going to be a wonderful pro program. Um, I have to pull out the glasses because I can't read without it. <laughs> um, this is the first installment of the four-part series entitled Demystifying Probate and Estate Planning here at the Noel Webster Library. As, as uh, Moore said, I'm Owen Egan. I'm the West Hartford Probate Court Judge. Uh, this first session is what is the probate court. Uh, by the time you leave here today, it is my hope that each of you will be able to answer that question. So I'm going to ask you after. I'm going to quiz each one of you. <laughs> um, before we begin, I would like to thank the West Hartford Public Libraries for, their, for co sponsoring this event with me, especially Maura Boudreau, who spent a lot of time helping set this matter up. Uh, and uh, she did a wonderful job uh, helping organize the event and arranging this, this nice room. I'd also like to thank Jen Evans, who was filming for Channel 5. Uh, I want to thank, uh, thank her. She's going to air this program on WHC-TV on Sunday at 9 a.m., starting Sunday at 9 a.m., and then 9 p.m. So you might be on TV. You better tighten up your tie and look good. Um, I would also like to thank Richard Marone, who's not here this evening. He is the chairperson of the uh, estate and probate section of the Connecticut Bar Association, and he helped put together this wonderful panel and uh, the panel uh, also includes uh, uh, seven other attorneys who will be speaking at the other three uh, sessions that we intend to have. Um, he picked a great group of attorneys and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to introduce them quickly. Uh, first we have attorney Paul Udon. He's a graduate of the University uh, of University of Connecticut School of Law. Attorney Udon practiced for five years in the probate court in um, Hartford and then he started his firm back in 1976 here in West Hartford, and it's the firm Atlas and Udon. Uh, Paul has practiced in this area, in the probate area, for nearly 50 years, and I don't think there's anything that Paul hasn't seen or done in the probate section. Um, he, he can do large estates, small estates, litigation, uh, conservatorships, uh, you, you name it, Paul's, Paul's done it. And Paul is an excellent resource uh, if you have a legal question. Uh, next, we have uh, Attorney Don, Don Neville. Don, just raise your hand. Uh, uh, Don, Don is a graduate of the University of Connecticut School of Law as well. Uh, Don has practiced for nearly uh, 20 years, and he currently works at his firm, Kroll, McNamara, Evans, and Delante. And uh, Don is a trial lawyer. Don tries uh, cases in all courts in the state of Connecticut, in the federal court, in the state superior court, and in the probate court, in many of the probate courts in Hartford County and throughout the state of Connecticut. Don is an excellent trial lawyer, very experienced with helping fiduciaries, beneficiaries, and the like. Also a great resource. And finally, last, not, last but not least, we have Mary Ann Sharon, a graduate of the Columbus School of Law at Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. Attorney Sharon has over 30 years legal experience. She currently serves as, as, as an attorney and a partner in the firm that she founded, Charter Oak Law Group, based in Bloomfield, Connecticut. Marianne is also an expert in probate law and litigation. Marianne has done a, an awful lot of work in all the probate courts and in other courts. 
She is also uh, an expert in pooled trusts, special needs trusts, and elder law. Each of our panelists here tonight are experts in their field, and by volunteering their time, they are doing a wonderful community service for the town of West Hartford. By my count, all four sessions, not just this session, but after all four sessions are completed, all of the panelists will have provided approximately $100,000 in legal service to this community. So it's a wonderful, wonderful gift that they're, they're providing to you. Um, and I can say with confidence, the, this, these panelists and the other panelists are uh, happy to speak, and these panelists are very happy to speak tonight. Before I hand off uh, the microphone to the panelists, I would like to offer a bit of background to help you begin to answer the question, what is the probate court? The probate court system in America, in, in America has existed since colonial times in, in, in this state for about 300 years. Originally, the probate courts in Connecticut administered a small number of matters such as decedents' estates and guardianships. And, uh, but over the years, the jurisdiction of the probate court has increased dramatically. And there's a number of uh, issues that the probate court handles. Originally, there were only four probate courts in Connecticut. There was one in New London, there was one in Fairfield County, one in New Haven, and one in Hartford. Presently, there are 54. At one point, there were over 100. It's now been reduced to 54. All of the probate judges are elected in the state of Connecticut. They're the only judges that are elected. And each probate uh, judge runs his court just as I run the West Hartford Probate Court. Um, today, today, the courts deal, as I said, with a, a wide variety of matters that affect the lives of Connecticut citizens uh, from birth until death. For instance, some of you are, might be familiar with the fact that decedents' estates are processed in the court. So if someone passes and an estate needs to be opened so that assets can be transferred to the next generation or to whomever is, is listed in a will, um, they, they would uh, file a, an application with the court to process that decedents' estate. Um, the probate court also handles adoptions, which is my favorite. It's a, it's a, a wonderful uh, thing to be a participant in an adoption. It's a very joyous moment for uh, parents and children alike, and it's, it's uh, my, favorite, uh, my favorite thing to do. Uh, guardianships, and that's guardianships of all types. Conservatorships, where a loved one is in, incompetent and might need to have a conservator appointed to handle their affairs. Name changes, people ask for name changes. Termination of parental rights. Commitments for those who are um, uh, psychiatrically uh, have psychiatric disabilities, uh, and that would be over at the Hebrew home. We do commitment hearings for people who have psychiatric disabilities, and then um, also commitments for treatment of people with drug and alcohol abuse problems, as well as tuberculosis. People who have tuberculosis can be committed. I haven't had one of those, so. Um, with, with such a wide variety of issues under our authority, I can assure you that if anyone comes to the probate court in West Hartford, even if they're not in the right place, our staff will help direct the person to where they need to be. Um, our staff is led by a, a wonderful crew. Lo uh, the um, crew leader is Lori Rico. She's been there for over 30 years, and she's a member of this community. Uh, Marlene Karp is the deputy chief. Um, Lori is the chief clerk. Marlene Car Karp is the deputy uh, uh, Chief Clerk, then uh, James Felice, there's um, uh, Patty Cheevers, Miss um, um, Cohen, and then we have uh, Roberta, uh, uh, Samantha Roberts, who is a new addition. She's, uh, she's an attorney, and um, uh, Marissa Marconi. I think I have them all. Um, they, they are wonderful people. They help me and, and guide me through, through the process. Uh, they are the most compassionate and sensitive people that I have ever worked with. They are kind. They're constantly aware of people who are coming into the court who are vulnerable and in need of assistance. So if you haven't visited the probate court, I would suggest that you just, just stop by. The probate court is on the second floor of the town hall, which is across the way here. And the, the clerk's office is on that second floor across from the council chambers. The council chambers doubles as uh, my courtroom in the day. And the, the town is wonderful to uh, let us use that. It's a marvelous place to conduct hearings. The chairs are very comfortable, and uh, there's plenty of space for visitors and people to observe. So um, if you haven't visited the probate court, it's a good place to go. There are plenty of resources there. Um, and there's some of these handouts come from the <coughs> probate court. 
you can pick those up there, and it gives you a guide as a layperson as to how to, how to handle an estate or a guardianship, et cetera. Um, our offices are open from 8.30 until 4.30, and uh, in the probate court, our goal is to provide service to anyone and everyone who walks through the door. So you may be walking through the door with a federal matter, and our staff will direct you to the federal court or a state superior court matter, and they'll direct you to the proper court. If it's to be filed in another probate court, our court will accept it. We'll accept it even though it's to be filed in another probate court, and we will make sure it's transferred to the appropriate court. So it's a user-friendly place, and I would like everyone to understand that. Please stop by, use, use the system, and meet the staff. They're, they're wonderful people. Um, the court, again, as I said, prides itself on being sensitive and compassionate to all those that we serve, especially the people who are most vulnerable. While the staff cannot provide legal advice, they can help point you in the right direction, and, and they will provide you with a wealth of materials and handouts to take home. You can also visit West Hartford Probate Court's website, and they will, they, there's additional forms there, and the State Probate Administration website at www.ctprobate.gov for more helpful information. That's www.ctprobate.gov, and you can get more information and forms there. Now we'll hear from our panelists. Uh, I, would, I would ask you to hold your questions until after everyone has spoken, uh, when, when we will allow the audience the opportunity to ask questions of the panel as a whole. First, we will hear from attorney Paul Udon. And Paul? Me. Oh, excuse me. I apologize. First, we will hear from attorney Mary Ann Sharon. All right. Uh, I think that microphone works, and you're welcome to use this. Um, the, no, no the, the other microphone is the, <laughs> Don, can you grab that micro? Yes. Oh. Thank you very much. Okay. That one doesn't seem to work either. Can you try a little louder, just, just so we know. All right. No, I there mean, we it, go. Maybe Hello. it is working. It is working? Yes. All right. So, so as, as the monitor has just told you, do you want to hear? No. Oh, well. <laughs> The piece of probate is encompassing so many different things, and the piece of probate that the three of us are going to talk to you about tonight is what happens when somebody passes away. Okay. Not that one. The one that you took off the desk. Now I have three microphones, <laughs> and it really will feel like a press conference. So what we are going to be talking about is when someone passes away, all right? So this, the probate process for our conversation tonight is about the transfer of property at a person's death. Right? That's what this piece is about. As you heard from his honor, certainly uh, there are so many other things that the probate court does, but this is what we're focusing on this evening. And so if somebody has a will, all right, then the probate procedure and process that we're talking about tonight is really to ensure that the wishes of the person who has the will are in fact disposed of and followed. All right, so we want to know, we want to make sure if we go through the time and effort and expense of creating a will, we want to make sure that the people we want to get our things get them. If the person dies and does not have a will, then there is a statute that applies and the law has decided who gets your property. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what our roles are. I'm going to be talking tonight about a simple estate procedure. Paul is going to be talking about what is, we refer to as a complex estate procedure. And then if you make it through what we two say, you're going to get to the juicy part, which is what Don is going to be talking about. And it's really about claims, litigation. Um, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in probate court that um, 
I don't know, could be a made for TV type of show. I, I don't know what to tell you. I have three microphones here. I'm trying my best. Okay, is that better? All right. So let's start off with some terms. One of the first term that we're going to be using, and as attorneys, this is our vocabulary, and we use these terms every day. The first one I'm going to give you is called a decedent. The decedent is the person who's dead. All right? So it's just as simple as that. If the decedent had a last will in testament, that's what the legal term is, he is called a testator, and he has what's called a testate estate. If the decedent died without a will, then we have an administration, and it's called an intestate estate. The next term I want to talk to you about is we are so familiar with this. If somebody has a will, we know that there are what? Beneficiaries under the will. A beneficiary is the person or persons who get the property under the will. We all kind of wait to see who's getting what. That's beneficiary designation. That's beneficiary. And then we have heirs. Heirs are our family members, linear descent. And sometimes the heirs are our beneficiaries, and sometimes they're not. Because a beneficiary doesn't have to be a family member, right? It could be a charity. It could be your best friend. Uh, what, Leona Helmsley? I think her beneficiary was her dog. OK? So um, now, also in Will is a term that we probably are all familiar with is something that's called an executor, right? So the executor is the person we appoint to wrap up our affairs. And that person, if we don't have a will, is called an administrator. And both of these people have the same duties and responsibilities. And they have what's called fiduciary obligations. And a fiduciary is a person who owns a duty to the person who died to wrap up his or her affairs. And he owns a duty to the people who are to receive the property and to protect the property and to make sure that the beneficiary's interests are protected. So I want uh, some people have this idea that if somebody has a will and they're named as the executor in the will, they can just like go to the bank right away. But you can't. An executor must be appointed by the probate court. So the executor only has authority once he or she has a certificate from the probate court appointing him or her as the executor. So it's not enough just to be named in the will. The will has to be admitted to the court, the judge has to approve it, and then you become appointed as the executor. And you would also be appointed as an administrator if there was no will. The last term that I'm going to give you is what's called a taxable estate. Everybody in Connecticut will talk about taxes all the time. So I want to make sure you understand what is and is not a taxable estate. In Connecticut, if the gross assets of the decedent, and that includes assets that he or she solely owned, assets that were jointly held, assets that someone was a beneficiary under, we add them all up, and if they are less than $2 million, it is called a non-taxable estate, in Connecticut anyway. If they add up to more than $2 million, that is what we call a taxable estate in Connecticut. And if they add up to more than $5.49 million, then it is taxable federally also. So now, you guys got a lot of handouts and some paper. And the first one that I want you to look at is the Allen and Susan. Because what we have done, and it helps keep us on track, but it gives you something with which we can use as an example and a hypothetical. And we try to pick a couple, Alan and Susan, you'll see on the second page. Okay. Alan's 78, Susan is 75. I think she looks pretty good. All right, they have three children. And one of their children, their daughter, has three children of her own. And that is the family unit that we're going to be talking about tonight. And as each one of us talks, we're going to be building on this example for you. And you will see on the next page of that handout that there are assets there. And that's what we're going to be using tonight as we work through some of the, some of the forms 
and try to identify what kind of estate Alan and Susan have. Now for the example that I'm working with, Alan is the one who dies. Alan is the decedent, okay? Also, just for our purposes, Alan has a will. He gave, he has a will, I call it a sweetheart or an I love you will. And it's because he gives everything to his wife. If, she's a, if she predeceases him under the terms of his will, it goes equally to his three children, all right? He does not have a trust. So those are the parameters that I am working with for purposes of my presentation tonight. <clears throat> now, I just told you that Alan has passed away. So Susan needs to figure out what, what's going on. And she contacts, let's just say for this example, my office. And we ask her um, to come to the office and meet and we ask her to bring a few things with her. A death certificate, we need a death certificate. We, I ask her if she can provide me with that list of assets that each of you have. I ask her to let me know what the date of death values were on some of these assets and that is also on your list. I ask her to come up and identify some of the expenses related to his passing that would include the funeral bill. So by the time she comes to the office, whether she brings someone like her daughter or not, we have something with which to start. And so the conversation really starts off with, what do we have? And she gives me the death certificate. Why is the death certificate important? We need to know he's dead, okay? I mean, it's as simple as that. It's an official document that confirms that somebody is no longer able to receive Social Security. All right, so they're gone. And the next thing I sit with her and talk to her about is what are the assets? What does he have? What do you two have? And if you look to, let's kind of, if you don't mind, let's move to that asset sheet because this is really what I'm gonna be addressing with her. And she says, my husband and I own our West Hartford home. And I say, oh, do you own it with right of survivorship? Do you jointly own it? And she says, yes. So that's an asset that is jointly owned and she is going to receive it at his death. It goes to her, right? The same thing about the old Lime home. And she says, we bought that so long ago. We vacationed there with our children. Our children grew up there. And I ask her, do you have an idea about the values of these properties? And she says, my son went on Zillow and he looked it up, and our home in West Hartford is worth about 400,000, and the old Lime home, can you believe it, Marianne, is now worth 350. And so I start taking these notes because I know that I need to start totaling up what these assets are. Because in the back of my mind, what? I need to know if we have a taxable estate or a non-taxable estate. And the other thing I am extremely mindful of is if he died solely owning any asset. So we know so far the house is not solely owned by him, it's jointly owned. Let's move on to the next item. And she says that his car is worth $25,000. And I say, is it jointly held? And she says, no, we each had our own cars in our own names. So immediately I know we have one solely owned asset and it's worth $25,000. I am not as interested in her car. Why? Because she's alive. So I don't need to know what the value of her car is. I do notice that they have equal value cars. I think that's nice. But the next thing we move to is the joint brokerage account. OK, it's a joint asset. It's not solely owned. It's owned by the two of them. She gets it, right? He has a 401k. Now, we don't jointly own 401ks with our spouses. It is solely owned. It is his. So what is she on this 401k? She's a beneficiary. So she's entitled to receive that 401k at his death. The next thing on our list that she tells me about is they have a joint bank account. She gets that. She goes to the bank. She lets them know that he's died. She gives them a copy of the death certificate. It is her money. He has a life insurance policy. Again, she tells me that she's the beneficiary on that. 
policy is worth 50,000. She tells me he's already, she's already been paid. She received the check already. But that is, excuse me, a beneficiary designation. And so at the end of this, I calculate what all the assets are. And I determine that we have one solely owned asset, the car worth $25,000, and we have jointly beneficiary held total gross assets of 1.7 million. So I know we're under the $2 million. The next thing I do is I talk to her about some of the debts. What's out there? She shows me the paid funeral bill, right? So sometimes those can be quite expensive. And she tells me that she used the proceeds from the life insurance to pay for it, but she paid for it. So we have a paid funeral bill. I ask her about, are there any other debts, expenses of his last illness when he was in the hospital, something that may not have been covered by insurance? Did he owe loans? Did he have a credit card that was in his own name? And we start to go through these debts. And, <clears throat> and then I also ask her, the answer is no. But I just want you to understand that there can be more than these assets here. You can ask somebody, did he co-own a business? Did he have a business? Did he have any pending litigation that he was the plaintiff in that we might get a recovery on? Those are assets too, right? Um, how about patents, copyrights? Maybe he was a singer-songwriter in his spare time. He was getting royalties from a song that he wrote. Those are assets that we also want to pry and figure out what exists. Because when we close an estate, when he gets that royalty check, right, what is she going to do? We need, it's going to be more payable to him, and we need to make sure that she's able to cash and deposit those checks. It's not in our example, but I just wanted you to think a little more broadly than what might be standard assets. I ask her if she has the will, and she hands me in a, in a nice envelope the original will. And we must have an original will. And there's two reasons for that. One, if we can't find the original will, there is the legal presumption that it was destroyed. Second, we need the original will because there is a statute that requires us to submit an original will to either the executor or to the probate court within 30 days of death. And if you don't do it, you could go to jail for a year. <laughs> and the maximum fine is $1,000, but we take it seriously. The law takes it seriously because the disposition and transfer of everything that we have worked our life for is very important and we try to respect that. So she hands me the will. I ask her again if there's a trust, and she says no, there was no trust. So based on this meeting and this conversation, she looks at me and she says, what do we have to do, Marianne? And I'll say, all right, I got this, okay? And for your purposes, let me just explain that there are three probate procedures, three types. And so as she's giving me this information, I am trying to figure out and determine which of the three we fall into. The first one is called a tax purpose only, TPO. And I want you to understand that this type of estate occurs when there are only non-solely owned assets, meaning that every asset is either jointly held, has a beneficiary designation, okay? So, or in trust. And that gets me to a point that I, I want to make sure each one of you understands. Even if all of your assets are in a trust, you do not get to avoid probate court. You must file a tax purpose only estate, okay? In a tax purpose only estate, the documents that have to be filed in the probate court are a copy of the death certificate, the original will, if there is one, and a copy of the deed that shows that property is jointly held, whatever assets are jointly owned. And if there is a trust, you have to have a copy of the trust. The forms that have to be filled out, and I think I pass this around, is what's called a form seven, I gave you a form 706 NT. NT means non-taxable. In our example, right, it is non-taxable because the gross estates are only 1.7 million. But we must prepare and submit this form. And this form has us identify 
solely owned assets, assets that are jointly held, assets that have a beneficiary designation. Okay? I'm not going to go in detail in this form, but I just want you to know that this is the form that has to be submitted to the probate court. And then if there is a will, there's something called a form 211. I did not give that to you, but that is just the form that is called an, uh, the affidavit for filing a will not for probate. Because we're not probating the estate, everything already has a a joint owner or a beneficiary designation, but we don't want to get in trouble, we don't want to go to jail, and so we must submit the original form to the court, the original will. The second type of estate, as I told you, is called, is, well, maybe I didn't tell you, is an affidavit in lieu estate. This occurs when there are solely owned assets that do not exceed $40,000. There can certainly be jointly owned assets, like a house, two houses in our example, the bank accounts, but if there is a solely owned asset that is less than, or the total, there could be several, that total less than 40,000, we can do an affidavit in lieu. That is what is called a simple estate. If the assets exceed $40,000, or if there is solely owned real estate, no matter what the value, you must do a full sometimes called a complex estate, and that is what Paul is gonna be talking about. Now, in this case, I've kind of already given you enough hints, all right? What does Alan have? He has one solely owned asset that is less than what? Less than the $40,000 threshold. So we're going to be filing an affidavit in lieu estate. And the documents that we file are really the same as what we file in a TPO or tax purpose only estate. It's just that we now have to file what's called the PC212, another document that you guys have. And it's really just there to show you that this is what you have to file. Looks like this. And this document asks us to identify the solely owned assets. It also asks about debt, funeral expenses. It asks about administrative expenses, okay? Attorney's fees, for example. Probate court fees, for example. And if the assets exceed or are greater than the expenses, then you, you might, might have, have to file something, something called the PC212A. So in other words, that who gets the rest of it? It's a distribution of the balance, all right? So, so anyways, now you guys know that what Susan has to file, we have to file a 212, we have to identify the solely owned assets, we have to identify the expenses, we have to file that 706MT, which states what the gross estate is of Alan. We have to submit a copy of the death certificate, a copy of the paid funeral bill. We have to submit the will. There is no trust, as I told you. Um, we have to submit copies of the deeds, all right? And when we put this package together and we submit it to the court, the probate court has to review it, make sure we did it right. Say, hmm, this looks right, this looks good. And the probate court will then, after it reviews it, send me two documents. One of them is called a certificate of no tax. And all that is, it means that the court has looked at it and has determined that the estate is non-taxable. It's looked at the 706 NT, and they agree that the assets are less than, one point, less than $2 million. And then they also send you a bill. It's an invoice, some people call it a tax, and it is based on the gross estate. And so last night, when I was thinking about this presentation, I thought maybe some of you would be interested in what that fee would be on a $1.7 million estate. And that fee is $2,740, made payable to the treasurer state of Connecticut. Once you pay this fee, the court will then issue us the releases of lien. And these are two of the most important documents that you can receive because they get recorded 
on the land records. In our example, Alan and Susan owned two pieces of property. So we, net, we get two releases of lien, one that gets recorded on the West Hartford land records, one that gets recorded in the Old Lyme land records. If Susan ever wants to refinance, if she ever wants to sell those properties, these releases of liens must have been recorded. And the last thing that the court is gonna give us is a decree transferring Alan's car, okay? So Susan now gets to pick which car she wants to drive. She can either drive her husband's or she can drive her car. But that is essentially <laughs> what the simple estate procedure is. And I thank you for following me as best you could. And now Paul is gonna talk about a complex estate. Thank you. You just, you just want you remember the question, what, what is the probate court? And as uh, Marianne identified, the probate court is assisting in the orderly transfer of assets so that assets can pass on to next generation or whatever beneficiary is designated by the person who passed away. Thank you very much, Marianne. Trying to have uh, the microphone swapped out. You may hear better, yeah. but I don't. <laughs> but, but I don't think I'll be better than Marianne. So, <laughs> so I'm going to pick up uh, with regard to the Susan and Ann, Susan and Allen scenario uh, a few years later, after. Alan has died, but now Susan dies. And she hasn't changed her will. So she still has that will that she did many years ago with Alan. And under the provisions of the will, she leaves everything to Alan, but he's dead. And in the alternative, at least, she leaves everything to her three children. Um, what Marianne didn't say was that she named her daughter, Jennifer, as the person to serve as executrix of her estate um, if she was predeceased by Alan. So Jennifer, who's the daughter who lives in West Hartford, and Susan lived in West Hartford also, uh, is the person who is most likely going to take, pick up the ball uh, and start the process of settling her mother's affairs. All of the assets that had been previously owned jointly uh, by Susan and Alan are now in Susan's name, uh, with the exception, really, of a couple of things that were on the asset list. One is Susan had her own life insurance policy, and that's still in existence. She had named her children as the beneficiaries of that life insurance policy, so they can go and proceed immediately to file a claim uh, on the life policy and collect the benefits. They don't have to go to the probate court to do that. They don't have to do whatever. They just have to keep the insurance company happy. In addition, she had inherited her husband's 401k plan his retirement plan, and after that, uh, his, his death, she named her children as the beneficiaries on that plan. So again, they can immediately contact the custodian or the administrator of the retirement plan, submit the appropriate claim forms, and collect the benefits. I would just say, um, as a word of caution, uh, at least with regard to retirement benefits, uh, sometimes it's not a good idea to submit a claim to collect the benefits and collect them all at one time because they may have adverse income tax consequences. So uh, I advise clients always in that circumstance, at least as to the options that would be available to them uh, concerning collection of retirement benefits. And if they don't uh, have a clear understanding and I can't make myself clear to them, I suggest that they speak of their accountants as to how they might best want to collect those benefits. But the other assets that Susan had and inherited from her husband are now solely in her name. So when Jennifer comes in to see Marianne or me or whoever she goes to with regard to the process of selling her mother's affairs, the initial interview and questions are going to be identical to what Marianne went through. We want to know what the assets are. We want to know what the, who the family is. We want to know the structure, or the, the, 
the uh, uh, names and addresses of the family, and um, we make a determination right away in, in this particular case that we are going to have to formally probate Susan's will. We're going to have to submit it to the court uh, along with a petition to have it admitted to probate. And if the court determines that it was the valid last will and testament of Susan, then it will authorize, empower uh, Jennifer, the daughter, as executrix to proceed with the settlement of Susan's affairs. In the materials provided, um, you've got a multi-page document, petition uh, for administration of probate of will. And I'm not going to go through it line by line, but I just, th this is an important document in terms of that the information that is set forth in this document in, in, in the petition gives the court clear information about who has a legitimate interest in the estate, who should be receiving notice of what's going on, and it's going to give some information about both the decedent, Susan, and information about the beneficiaries of the estate, at least as to the questions that the, in the petition about whether they may or may not have received assistance from the state of Connecticut or other public welfare programs. It also is going to, it asks about uh, the, the closest relatives, the, the family tree. Uh, there are different scenarios that may be presented. Um, if it's a second marriage and, the, and, these, uh, and if there's a surviving spouse who is not also the, ch the parent of the children, uh, but in any event, the petition, the information in the petition is critical uh, both for the court and it's critical in terms of what's going to transpire uh, after it is filed with the court. The initial, the, after uh, Jennifer has provided me all the information about the family, uh, we know that there, there's real estate, we know that the assets are probably going to be exceed, you know, a million dollars. We may not know. Um, everything, but we know enough that we have to formally probate the will. Uh, we submit the petition to the court along with the death certificate, along with the will. And if everybody who has a legal interest in the matter, in this case, Jennifer and her two brothers, are all in agreement, and if they say, yeah, that's mom's will, I don't have any objection to it, uh, let's, let's get this started. Uh, they can all, the three beneficiaries and, and heirs at law, uh, sign waivers consenting to the will being admitted to probate. So in theory, although not always in practice, um, the three heirs could come into my office. We could prepare and file, uh, prepare and sign the petition to admit the will to probate. We could take that petition along with the original will and along with a copy of the death certificate to the probate court and say, here's a, a petition to admit Susan's will to probate. There's no objection. Could you please uh, give us some certificates that show that Jennifer is now the executrix? And th the next day, Jennifer could start to collect the assets and do the things that an executrix oh. is supposed to do. Now, I say in theory, but not in practice. The, it's not Theory and practice are not too far apart, at least in the West Hartford Court, where there's great service and turnaround. But it may be a couple of days for the staff to process the papers and to locate the judge to sign the decree admitting the will to probate. But it can be very, it can happen very quickly. And certainly, um, I think all of us who practice have had circumstances where uh, within a, a few days after the client originally contacts us, uh, they're empowered in the, as the fiduciary of the estate to start the process of settling the estate. If we don't have everybody in town to sign the waivers, or if there's some other reason that uh, people don't want to sign waivers at that time, we submit the petition, the will, the death certificate to the court, and the, and the court will then send a notice uh, to all the parties in interest, and they'll say, Su in effect, the, the notice will say, Susan died, Jennifer presented this petition, uh, Susan had a will dated such and such, and on uh, someday in the future, usually two or three weeks down the line, uh, the court will be issuing a decree admitting the will to probate and authorizing Jennifer to proceed with the settlement of the estate. And if you have any objection, 
being the first people who receive this notice. If you have any objection uh, to the will or any questions, you can contact the court and you can ask for a more formal hearing on the will. And it, if that happens, then Don's going to get involved and the judge is going to get involved, uh, both doing their jobs and both doing their jobs well. Uh, in our scenario, um, nobody's going to object to the will. So S Susan, excuse me, Jennifer gets qualified as executrix. She's the fiduciary. She has a responsibility to the beneficiaries of the estate. She has a responsibility to the creditors of the estate. And I think that's something that sometimes gets lost in the process. Um, you know, I'm uh, executor of my father's estate. My sisters and I are the beneficiaries. It's our money. It's our assets. Well, it really, it's our money and our assets only after the decedent's legal liabilities and responsibilities are addressed. That includes uh, any bills that may be outstanding that are valid bills. They need to be paid. Those creditors have a prior claim against the assets of the estate superior to the rights of the beneficiaries. The executor has the responsibility of filing any final income tax returns that may be required of the decedent and paying any taxes that might be due. Uh, the executor has the responsibility of resolving any outstanding obligations that the decedent may have. There may be ongoing litigation. Similarly, the executor would have the responsibility of collecting uh, any claims or assets that the decedent might have. Uh, I loan you know, money to my partner. He owes me $10,000. My executor's got to collect that money or try to collect that money um, and add that as part of my estate. The, the executor's first sort of major charge, however, after they're appointed, is to, is to identify all of the assets that were in the decedent's name alone. And our example in Susan's estate, it's going to be the real estate, both in West Hartford and Old Lyme. It's now solely hers. It's going to be the brokerage account that used to be a joint account. Now it's hers alone. It's going to be the bank account. It will be everything other than her life insurance and the retirement plan, where they were named beneficiaries. The executor then, after he, she identifies all those assets, files an inventory with the court, a listing of all of those assets, and values those assets as of the date of death. In terms of the valuation of assets, some are pretty straightforward. Uh, the real estate, uh, in, if it isn't going to be sold, you probably get an appraiser to give you some uh, official information in terms of the value as of its current value as of the date of death. There are certain uh, very specific rules the Internal Revenue Service has regard to uh, valuing uh, and how to value um, securities, stocks and bonds and the like. Um, generally, uh, we can look at a, a, a broker statement and say this is what the value is. But if you follow the IRS rules, there may be nickel and dime differences in terms of date of death value of securities. Um, automobiles, we often go to a Kelly Blue Book or, or some other uh, online service to determine what a car might be worth. Uh, more problematic assets, which we don't have in, don't have in our example, but uh, can be a challenge, would be a, a business entity, a copyright, a royalty. Um, and uh, in those situations, sometimes you have to uh, do some research or get some uh, a special appraiser to help come up with a value on those assets. The inventory is to be filed, um, at least if we follow the <coughs> statutes direct specifically, within 60 days of the date of the appointment of the executor. In reality, it most often is not filed within that time period. Um, and if one is filed within that time period, in most situations, and except the, the simplest of estates, you don't have a clear idea as to the value of all of the assets. So you may file an initial inventory that lists some of the assets. It may even list the real estate, but it may say value undetermined. And then subsequently, you would file a supplemental inventory or, or corrected inventory uh, showing what the value of all the assets are. What I didn't mention when we filed the petition to admit the will to probate, um, 
is that when that petition is filed with the court, a copy of it is to be sent to everybody who has an interest in the estate. That would be the people who would be the heirs at law, who, who might inherit the estate if there was not a will, and it would be all of the people who were named in the will, and institutions, the charitable organizations, or whatever, that entitled to receive anything under the will. They're all to receive a copy of the petition to admit the will to probate and a copy of the will. And there's a certification on the petition that where the petitioner says, I did it. And so when the court sends its subsequent notice to everybody and says, I received this, it has received this petition, and on such and such a day they're going to admit the will to probate, everyone is, who receives that should have already received the petition and will, and they know what it's about. Um, I don't know what the specific, if there's a specific penalty for not doing it, other than you're filing something under false statement to, to the court. There's probably a, a, a penalty. But the, the process is such with regard to the filing of the will, actually through the whole probate process, transparency is, is important. The people who have an interest in the estate have a right to have information about the estate. When, it, when it's the filing of the petition with the court, when you file an inventory with the court, with the people have a right to know what those assets are, uh, what the p values are, and they have an opportunity if they think uh, that the inventory is incorrect in some way, uh, they can object to it and they can ask for a hearing at the court uh, to hear what the basis of their objection to the inventory might be. Doesn't happen very often. Uh, sometimes, if, if those issues arise, it's, it's an oversight, uh, and the person who has the question, if they ask the executor and discuss the matter, it, it, it can be resolved without having to get the court involved. Uh, in some situations, uh, uh, people don't communicate that easily with each other, and the court does get involved. Uh, so the inventory gets filed, um, and then the next thing the executor has to do at some point is file a document called a return of claims with the court. And that's a, that's a, uh, a document that says to the court, says to, in, a, in the public record, that these are the people who have presented bills, claims against the estate, and that this is who they are, how much they've claimed, and in effect, how much is valid of the claim. Uh, the easy claims are, you know, the final income tax obligation, the final electric bill, the final Comcast bill, wh whatever was due and owing as of the moment of death. And I think that um, with regard to both the preparation of the inventory and the, and, the, and the preparation of the list of claims, what's critical is we're providing, the fiduciary is providing the court and providing the beneficiaries of the, of the estate with a snapshot as to what was the status of Susan's affairs as of the day she died. Now, when, the, when Jennifer was appointed as executrix, uh, the court contacted the Hartford Current, in this case, in West Hartford, uh, but the general rule is, is the probate court will notify, will notify, will publish in a newspaper of general circulation within the district in which the person's estate is being settled, basically a notice that says that Susan died and that Jennifer is the executrix of the estate. And that serves as notice to creditors of the estate if they bother to read the legal ads uh, to submit their, any bill they might have to Jennifer. Um, and Jennifer has to ultimately 150 days after she's appointed, again, usually sometime after that, but, but and not before 150 days after she's appointed, file this document called the Return of Claims with the court that says, this is who contacted me, these are the bills, this is, these are the ones I allowed. Um, allowance does not necessarily mean I paid them yet, but it means that they're valid claims that I will pay if I have the money to pay. Um, that 150-day period within which uh, the return of claims has to be filed, does not serve, however, to bar uh, creditors from submitting claims against the estate at a later date. Uh, what it does do, however, is after that 150-day period, 
if Jennifer has taken care of all of Susan's obligations and she's paid the, the, the claims and satisfied the creditors that she knows about, she can then proceed to distribute the estate assets to the beneficiaries. Uh, and if she does that, uh, and since some creditor comes in at a later date and says, oh, gee, you know, a year ago, I just found out your mother died a year ago and she owed me $10,000, and, and uh, Jennifer can say, well, the estate settled. I don't have the $10,000 to pay you, even though your claim might be valid. Now, there is a process uh, where the creditor can then proceed against the beneficiaries of the estate to try to get their, their bill paid. And we're not going to discuss that today, but I think that what's important is that um, even in a compl complicated estate or a complex estate, uh, as uh, Marianne may have said, the estate can be resolved and settled within a fairly short period of time. Uh, I tell clients uh, you know, if they really want to be on top of things and we have all of the information, it's not unreasonable to expect that within nine or ten months things can be wrapped up, sometimes even quicker if, it, if there's very limited uh, assets. The Connecticut estate tax return has to be filed in all estates, as Marianne said. Uh, in our example, um, when Susan died, uh, if we add up the value of all her assets uh, and we include the retirement plan and life insurance, the value of everything is $1,775,000 or thereabouts. It's below the $2 million threshold for the Connecticut estate tax. So the Connecticut uh, form CT706NT, the non-taxable uh, estate tax form, can be filed. It's, it's fairly easy to follow. In fact, it's, it's one of those documents that when I initially meet with a client, um, I sometimes have in my file to serve really as a reminder and a checklist for me as to what information is going to be needed uh, to proceed with the process of settling the estate. If the tax return is filed, the return of claims is filed, we've got an inventory, we think that we've got everything addressed, then at that point, the executive's responsibility is to really file a final uh, report or a final account with the court saying, this is what I started with. These are the assets that I had under my control, the assets listed in the inventory. This is, then it also reports any changes in the assets because I sold the stock and I made a gain or I got dividends on the stock or sold the cars, whatever it may be. And it's going to show the payment of all the bills it's going to show the payment of the funeral bill, the creditors, whatever it may be, and it'll show what is left on hand to be distributed. So uh, if Susan had an estate of, you know, with, with $50,000 worth of expenses overall, uh, she's, what's going to be left over is going to be something less than uh, $50,000 less if it's on the inventory. I'm going to show how those assets are to be distributed among the beneficiaries, a third to each of the uh, children. Uh, I'm going to provide a copy of that report to all of the beneficiaries, to the, the children that, who are the beneficiaries of the estate. I'm going to submit it to the court, and I'm going to ask the court to approve it. Um, again, as with the petition to uh, admit the will to probate, if everybody consents, you can submit it to the court, and the, and the court will act fairly quickly in terms of issuing a decree uh, admitting the will to probate. When we submit a final account or a uh, financial report with the court. If everybody uh, is local and available and uh, doesn't have any objections, we can file a waiver of hearing uh, signed by all of the beneficiaries and file those documents with the court. And the court, again, will be fairly quick in a matter of a couple of days or maybe a couple of weeks, uh, but approving uh, that financial report. What we're going to get from the court uh, when this account, the finance report is filed with the court, it's we're, gonna, we're, we're concerned about the real estate. We're concerned that, um, in effect, clients always say to me, well, where's the new deed for the real estate? Well, you don't get a new deed for the real estate, but you get a certificate of devise or distribution, which the court will issue, that basically says, Susan died, Susan owned real estate in West Hartford. Under her will, the real estate in West Hartford goes to her three children that sets it forth. And then we record that document in the land records in West Hartford, along with the document uh, confirming that the state of Connecticut does not have any 
uh, lien rights against the property for any unpaid uh, Connecticut estate taxes. Um, I, th I, th I think we have, uh, we've just settled Susan's estate in record time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paul. <laughs> I just want to make two comments. Um, first, after listening to Marianne and Paul, you've learned that assets can pass m several ways. Some of the ways that were discussed were at, at the probate court through, through a will or by the laws of intestacy if someone died without a will and owned an asset solely. By contract, if they have an insurance contract or an insurance policy, they designate a beneficiary. In this case, the husband and wife designated each other. Um, beneficiary designation on a 401k, for instance, where, where the parties identify the wife or, or the children as secondary beneficiaries. Assets can pass that way as well. And they also can pass um, as, as, uh, by law when they're held jointly, such as a piece of real estate that is held jointly with rights of survivorship. By law, if you own property with another, in this case a husband and wife own real estate, upon the passing of one, the survivor automatically owns the entire piece of property. And that can be true of a bank account, et cetera. So you learn that there are several ways to pass property. The property that passes uh, by way of will or by way of the laws of intestacy are probate assets. And those assets will be dealt with fairly and administratively by the probate court. Um, nevertheless, knowing all of that, Marianne made it clear, and I believe Paul made it clear, that tax returns have to be filed disclosing all of those assets. So um, another way, assets held in trust. Marianne mentioned you have to file the trust with the, the probate court. Those assets have to be disclosed. Insurance proceeds have to be disclosed. Joint property has to be disclosed. And those are, the, unfortunately, that's the, all those assets tallied together are what uh, the court uses to determine the fee that's charged to the estate. Uh, but there's several ways to pass assets, but nevertheless, a tax return has to be filed. So if you put everything in a trust, you still would have to file a tax return with the probate court and have, uh, have that issue addressed. Could, so thank you. Absolutely. Uh, on the trust issue, um, if people have assets in, in trusts, which is not, is not gonna save it necessarily any, any fees, but it may save a little bit of processing time. Uh, you, the trust is a private document, and it does not get filed with the court where it's available for review um, by, and everybody in the panel is part of it. It, 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 it is, is filed as an attachment or part of the, the filings that are filed with the a state tax return, which is a confidential document, and access is very limited uh, to both the court, the tax authorities, um, the person who files it, and in some circumstances, uh, those people who have an economic interest in the state. But the, the trust document itself remains a private document, as opposed to everything else that is filed with the probate court, at least everything else in conjunction with it. Southern of the state, which is a public record, public document, so that I can go to uh, the court in West Hartford and uh, I can ask to look at the records of the estate of whomever uh, and see whatever was filed in the court regarding uh, that estate so I can see what my neighbors will say if I'm a nosy person. <laughs> And, and to find a, 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 sometimes in terms of the things that Marianne and Don and I do um, is that we will go to court, not necessarily uh, for purposes of just being nosy, but we may have clients who ask us questions about uh, somebody's affairs, or they may have a financial claim against an estate that they want to pursue, and so we may do a little legwork in advance to see you know, what's there, whether it's worthwhile, you know, going down that road or whether we should uh, be pursuing some other avenue. But everything else is a, in, the, in the public, in the public record is a public record and available for any of you to go see. Yeah. 
Good evening, everybody. My name is Don Neville. I do probate litigation, so I don't do any planning. People come to me when something has gone sideways. Um, and I'm, I don't want to put the fear of God in everybody, but I can't stress enough that virtually every time somebody has come to me in connection with probate litigation, it's something that could have been addressed by going to see Paul or Marianne. Uh, it's, sometimes you can't help it. I'll, I'll talk, talk about, about some, some of those instances, instances later. later. But, but the planning piece and, and trying to get everything sorted out ahead of time can save people an enormous amount of hassle. And the reality is that that includes being honest with yourselves about who's in your family. That includes your brothers, your kids, your nieces and nephews, everybody. And that's an unfortunate reality, but it is what it is. Because when you designate somebody to be what people refer to as a fiduciary, they have control over your money. And the bank is going to honor it. The credit card companies are going to honor it. And you can't go against them if they were a properly appointed fiduciary. So I'm going to start on some basic ones to walk through. And I am going to end on some of the ones that have gotten um, really bad. Um, so the, the first thing I just want to let you know is that when you go to probate court and you have to do a trial, it's, it's a trial which means you have to be able to put in evidence, you have to do all of those. A lot of people think uh, akin to what Judge Egan was talking about, which is if, it, if it's a simple estate and you can go and talk with the staff members, I echo the fact that you should go and ask them questions. They'll give you as much answers as they possibly can. But an example that often comes up is um, Susan dies and we can't find the original will. It's not fatal, uh, but we have to go to probate court, we have to have a hearing, we have to put in evidence, we have to demonstrate to Judge Egan why he should accept that copy of the will, even if under certain circumstances, for example, let's say we could get a waiver from Susan and David, but Richard just didn't respond. There's a presumption that that will has been revoked because the original is gone, and therefore we have to do it. We have to prove to Judge Egan that that's the valid will. Invariably, what that requires is we're, we're going, going to have to call whoever drafted, drafted the will. So, so if Paul did it, we're going to have to haul Paul in. He's going to say, yeah, I sat across from Susan. You just did it last week. I don't know what she did with the original. This is the true and accurate copy. Okay, okay. That's, 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 that's probably not, not that difficult. difficult. But, but now, what if you can't find the will at all? So the, the first instance is, I'm sure they all say, make sure you put it in a safe place, put it in your safe deposit box, listen to them. There's a reason that they're telling you to do those things. God forbid you can't find the will at all. The will's gone. There are, under very, very narrow circumstances, situations in which you may be able to proffer an unsigned will. You should assume the answer is no. There's ways, but it's, it's incredibly unlikely. Now, in this instance, where we have three kids, if you can't find the will, and they had agreed to whack it up amongst the kids evenly, maybe there's no big deal because it may, may be for the planning purposes and tax purposes, for distribution purposes, it may not matter because they would all get through it. But now we're going to start, start to change it. Susan decided, decided to change her will. So now her will is giving Jennifer half the money because she has three kids and the two brothers don't. So she wants to provide for some college. Now the will can't get found. Now you've got a problem because at 1.7 million, David and Richard are probably not just going to give up that court. And so now you're going to start to have a problem. And they're going to come in and fight the will. Or they're going to come in and do something along those lines if you can't find it. It becomes much more difficult. And so again, that's why it's important to get these things squared out. And I also would urge everybody to have open discussions to the extent you can, given who your family members might be, about what your intentions are. And I say that only so that everybody's clear. You don't want David and Richard to find out after Susan has passed away that they're now each only getting 10% of a $1.7 million estate. And somehow Susan, who's been living in West Hartford for 10 years and seeing mom every day, gets 80%. You want to make sure that everybody knows so that everybody's clear about it. It's not a guarantee that problems won't happen, but at least it's an indication so that people understand that they're carrying out the wishes. Where, where I find the problem invariably comes in, though, is a situation in which, as I said, Susan lives in West Hartford. She goes and, or excuse me, 
uh, Jennifer lives in West Hartford. She goes and visits Susan every day. She brings the grandkids over every day. Everything's going fine. Susan starts to have problems with the money. So mom says, you know, I'll, I'll pay for a little bit of your mortgage. That goes on for a while and a while and a while, and it starts to build and build and build. And all of a sudden, that 1.7 is 0.7 at the end of the day. Now all of a sudden, there's a missing million dollars. And that's where the problems really start to begin. And those problems can get addressed if you go talk to Marianne and Paul ahead of time about how you should get that set up, how you can paper everything up correctly. That's, that's the best, best scenario. The worst scenario is that million dollars is just moving. And now all of a sudden, everybody's at each other's throats. And you want to know where that money went. Everybody's upset about it. And you need to be able to figure out how that money went. That's a very difficult one to navigate because who's in control of, of Susan's money? And the more elder, excuse me, yeah, Susan's money. The more elderly, of course, that Susan gets, the more it's the subject to undue influence she's going to be by Susan. And I don't even mean that pejoratively. It may just be that Susan sees that uh, Jennifer is constantly, you know, back on the rent. She's got three kids to feed. She's doing the best she can. She's got one job. She's doing everything she can. And she's sort of giving that money over. And then she starts to say, I'll just give it to you. I'll just give you the car. I'll give you all of it. All of those issues can be addressed up front. All of those issues can be thought through in a well-planned um, estate, provided you have people who are qualified to be able to do it. Because once that person passes away and that million dollars is missing, all of a sudden everybody's an enemy. And I've seen it rip just quite frankly too many families apart. Um, even when every indication is that Susan intended to give the money to Jennifer, she was helping Jennifer out, David and Richard didn't need the money, it doesn't matter. Um, that's not how the kids feel. Some of the other ways that, that it comes up for me at least is um, that there'll be a car. So right now we have Alan, Susan. But then a third car shows up because Jennifer can't get the loan. So she gets the loan with mom co-signing and they title the car in mom's name. Mom dies, now the car is mom's, which means it's part of the estate. But everybody knows, quote, it's Jennifer. Well, if the brothers say, I don't know that, then Judge Egan's got to decide the title to that property. But if it's titled with the DMV in the name of mom, you're going to have most impossible job trying to get that done. I'm trying to use easy, sort of simpler examples, but I've seen it with the old Limehouse. I've seen mortgages put on second properties for purposes of letting, you know, Jennifer buy the house or Richard go back to school. And if you don't get those things papered up easily, or, or I shouldn't say easily, but get them papered up up front, you can end up with a lot of problems. Um, the, the last piece I want to talk about is what I tend to see a lot more of now, which is that somebody prior to Susan passing away had either legal or equitable uh, access to all of her accounts. And I see it far more often with situations in which Susan becomes elderly. She doesn't want to deal with the day-to-day -day nonsense of, of life, so she designates Jennifer to be her power of attorney. And people had talked about fiduciaries. And when you become a fiduciary, and that could be a power of attorney, a conservator, an executor, that's a, that's a serious deal. You owe everybody to whom you owe that duty a very significant obligation. You gotta be loyal, you can't favor yourself over them, and you, you gotta, gotta make, make sure, sure that, that you, you treat, treat everybody, everybody honestly and fairly. And fairly. So, so somebody becomes power of attorney, and I'll, I'll give an example, unfortunately, of a case that I'm, that I'm involved with. It, it's still pending, so, um, but, a family member became power of attorney for two elderly people, um, and money went missing, allegedly to the tune of $2 million. And shortly before one of them passed away, it came to light, um, but that money wasn't recovered, and it, and it won't be recovered. And it's, for all intents and purposes, torn the, torn the family apart internally and externally. Um, and being able to know, and this is why I emphasize the importance of really being honest and truthful with yourselves about who you might want to have acting on your behalf. Because everybody has the best interests, and I, I, the, the sentence almost always starts with, I can't believe X did Y. And, and then the fact pattern comes out, and you just kind of go, oh my God. 
And once the numbers start to get up high, it's not recoverable because that person just doesn't have that kind of money. Um, and so you want to make really, really sure that you think through, you talk with your family members, you talk with your spouse, you talk with the other members of your family about who you're going to designate to sit in that role and to sit in that part. Um, I'm sure my, my colleagues will jump in on the ones that they have, but the, the probate court, in addition to some of the things that, that the court had talked about, and one of them was the decedent's estates, is also that the court does have the authority to require power of attorneys, called attorneys in fact, to file accountings. So if, if you should determine that a power of attorney took advantage of you, um, of a family member, it could even be in certain circumstances, you'd have to sort of make some arguments for it. You'd get their lawyer to do it. Um, but if uh, somebody that you might know, I have people that come see me where their neighbor has a lot of money and, and they're just, they, they see somebody that they've never seen before start coming around. Um, and the probate court has jurisdiction to tell that person, you better come to court, you better account for all the money. Hopefully they do, but it is an avenue to be able to do that. That's, um, that's also true in some circumstances for trustees um, of certain trusts. So I, I, I really, I don't want to send you out of here fearful after Paul and Mary Ann did such a great, great job, job of explaining how simple the probate process <laughs> is, <laughs> right? But, but what I just want to emphasize is the importance of planning, the importance of really thinking through your assets, how you want to have it dealt with after you pass away, and to really make sure that you go see somebody who's going to be able to take into consideration all of those issues. And you should talk to that lawyer honestly and frankly. It's, it's not uncommon that when I get involved in these cases, I end up having to go talk to the lawyer that drafted the will because I got to find out what was going on and I'm allowed to do that. Um, normally it'd be attorney client, but there's exceptions under some other trusts. And invariably they say, they never mentioned that about Susan. They never told me they had that problem with Richard. I didn't realize that Richard was, you know, suffering from severe dementia or anything along those lines. And so the lawyer never knew because the person didn't want to share that personal information about the family. They felt it was, you know, embarrassing or shameful or whatever the case may be. But the, the ramifications down the line, trust me when I tell you, are, are much worse than just disclosing to Paul or to Mary Ann, who I can promise you have heard it all, um, what, what your concerns might be. And that also includes how to provide. You may want to provide for those three grandkids. You may want to make sure you have the discussions with the two brothers. Um, so I, I'm more than happy to, to open it up to war stories from these two, but I just, I hope you'll walk out of here just knowing that you can solve yourself or you can save yourself a lot of those problems by going and seeing somebody like Marianne and Paul and get those issues squared out and have an open discussion with your family about it as well. Thanks, appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to open it up to questions, but before I do that, I just want to make uh, one comment about what uh, Don said. He talked about papering the file, and he, he, one example he gave was uh, when Jennifer borrowed money from her mother. Uh, a simple way to paper the file, and I'm sure the other counsel will have other ideas, is Jennifer could sign a promissory note to mom so that when mom's estate is probated, they know that Jennifer owes mom $50,000 or $100,000, and it would, come out of, it would come out of her share. Another way mom can say, gee, Jennifer's going to get $50,000 less than the other kids because she's already received $50,000, if, if mom wants to treat all the kids equally. Um, that, that's just one, one comment. I'm sure that counsel will have other comments. Um, the other is with regard to hearings in the probate court. Um, Don, Don is talking about f formal hearings, and he's absolutely correct. It's, it's a uh, formal hearing where rules of evidence apply. Uh, it, it's very much like the Superior Court or in the Federal Court where witnesses give oath and then they, they testify, documentation is presented, et cetera. But other hearings um, where there isn't a contest of a will or, or a fight about assets, 
uh, are, are more simple and coming into the West Hartford Probate Court, which I believe is the best court in the state of Connecticut. And I believe that, I believe that before I, I became the judge. Judge Berman and Judge Elkin did a wonderful job. Uh, the court is, is prompt, they're efficient, and as I said, not only are they fair, but they're kind. And it's very compassionate. And it isn't, it isn't my doing, it's, it's the staff. And I think all the other former judges would say that that staff is just wonderful and, and we're very lucky to have them. Um, but th those hearings are less formal and uh, we sit down at a conference table in the council chambers, as I said, and, the, and we, we, we talk about the case. Sometimes if it's a conservatorship, the matter is recorded, rules of evidence again apply, and people, people give oath, it's more formal. But um, oftentimes uh, you're, you're in court and the, the hearing is informal and comfortable and nothing to be afraid of. And so if you're without an attorney, which you shouldn't, you shouldn't necessarily be without an attorney, you can do things as a lay person, but a lot of files require uh, counsel. It's good, to, it's good to speak with counsel before going to court and, and uh, filing, uh, filing documents. And this isn't meant to be legal advice. This is meant to just give you an idea of, of what you need to do to prepare, as, as Don said, uh, for future, uh, future transition of property, et cetera. So, um, Can I say one thing? Absolutely. I, I, I meant to put in there that, that the other thing that I see a lot is, is the judge had talked about the $50,000, that, that all of a sudden after Susan passes away, uh, Jennifer says, well, the mom gave me that $50,000 or gave me that hundred thousand, that hundred and fifty thousand. So now it's not going to get charged against her pro rata share of the distribution. But the problem of course is mom's not here anymore. So the only person to say that it was a gift is Jennifer. And now we have to get into a trial. If you're talking about a hundred and fifty, two hundred, that's enough money for people to start fighting about it. And again, if, if that's what you want to do, there's ways that you can pay for that that type of gift up as well and avoid that kind of problem. But candidly the best way to do it is make sure everybody knows sort of what's going on. Excellent. Um, I just want to echo what Don just said. Um, in terms, although it doesn't, it doesn't always work because the families are not always perfect and the family relationships are <laughs> sometimes stressed. But um, when client, when, when I have a client who's going to do something. Uh, favoring one child or another or, or not providing for somebody for some reason, uh, I often uh, talk to them about that, it's, that it would be beneficial to share that with the people who are coming up on the short end of things uh, because after they're dead, they're not going to be there to explain why they gave more to Jennifer or somebody else. And, and I, I characterize it my term, not any uh, Legal word, but it's sort of a negative legacy that you can you you can, you can leave in a, a, a somebody with a that spending the rest of their life. Why did mom do that, or did dad do that, or whatever? And so um, the, that level of communication. You don't have to tell people what you're doing in your will or whatever, uh, but sometimes it is a, a good idea uh, to avoid, uh, at least to share the general. Uh, path that you're on uh, to, to avoid getting Don involved with me or, or what else in, in, in litigation and, and to avoid that that hurt that lasts forever you know it's it, instead of getting the fifty thousand dollars I've, I've didn't spend the rest of my life doubting why Jennifer died because mom loved her more. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the type that, of yeah, dynamic. That's, yeah, that's, what she <laughs> that's what you end up with. Yeah. Because Jennifer's going to be like, well, if, why wouldn't she give it to me? I was there for her, right? Do you understand? Like, this is, and it, what happens is we all become 10 years old again. And we live out that dynamic with our family members. And, you know, Jennifer was the one who was spoiled because she was so needy. And, you know, this is what mom and dad did for her. Like, and all of a sudden that resentment that, that the two brothers in this case would have for their sister. I, I gotta tell you, the gloves are off <laughs> when somebody passes away. And as, as his honor and all of us would say, you either see the best in people or it brings out their worst. I mean, families can co really come together when someone passes or they don't. And, uh, and, and so I just, you know, wanted to say this is what can happen. So you really do. We're kind of talking about planning, and that's another session. But the planning 
absolutely impacts the emotionality that comes within the state administration. Paul and I were talking about the procedures. There's not a lot of emotion in the procedures, but underlying it, there certainly is. You know, money is love. One of the so, things that I, I think we all have heard, sorry, George. It's okay, no. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that we've all heard when the, when the person on the short end of the stick comes to our office and complains yeah. about mom's will or dad's will is, you know, well, it just isn't right. Where it just isn't fair. Well, that doesn't get you very far. Um, and and it, but but it, you know, you need evidence. You need facts to, as to why it was not the right will or whatever. Uh, but you know, fairness and equity don't get you very far if you're contesting the will. Just to elaborate on one point, Marianne said, so we don't leave uh, going to question and answer on a bad note. There are beautiful stories uh, where people bend over backwards yep. to help siblings yep. and f help each other. And th th those don't get as much uh, notoriety because you hear about all the bad ones, but there are some beautiful stories. Yep. So um, I, I just want to let you know that there, there are three other uh, sessions planning planned. Uh, you, you have the uh, brochure here. It tells you when they are. Um, thankfully, the West Hartford Library is going to host those as well. Uh, so as we close the session, I want to thank the West Hartford Library as a whole, the board as a whole, for allowing us to put this series on, as well as the staff at the, this library, Noel Webster Library, for helping us make this first meeting such a success. I would also like to thank my staff. And my staff, again, please come and visit them, Lori Rico, Marlene Karp, James Felice, Samantha Roberts, Marisa Marconi, Patty Cheever, and, and Linda, Linda Cohen uh, are all excellent uh, uh, staff, excellent clerks, and they do a wonderful job. And they'll, they'll treat you with respect and kindness and fairness uh, above all. Uh, but, so please come in and visit us. Um, finally, I want to thank the panelists in this room who have so kindly given their, their time their knowledge and preparing and presenting for this evening. Uh, they, they spent a lot of time. Thank you. Um, we have about a half an hour for, for questions. We wanted it to be an hour, but uh, we've run over a little bit, so uh, we'll open the floor uh, for questions. If you could raise your hand, I'll, I'll call on you, and then you can address any of the panelists. Yes, sir. I want to be clear about the retirement contract with designated beneficiaries. Is that a part of the estate or is it not, especially for Connecticut estate tax purposes? I'm going to ask the panelists, could you repeat the question so everybody in the audience can hear and then answer the question? So, so, so the, the question deals with the retirement plan with a designated beneficiary. And I, I believe the question is that included in the estate taxable estate for Connecticut uh, estate tax purposes? And the answer is yes, it is. Uh, I characterize for clients when we talk about what's the taxable estate, wh what is it that we have to include either for Connecticut purposes or federal estate tax purposes, the standards are, are the same. Uh, and I break it down simply, is the passing of wealth that occurred as the result of the decedent's death whether it be because it was owned by property solely owned by the city, whether it was um, a, a life insurance policy that maybe had no value to the city when he died or she died, but where they could have designated the beneficiaries and then they did. Sometimes a good example of that sometimes is a, a group life benefit at work uh, where I didn't pay a nickel for it, uh, but I could change, decide who was the beneficiary if I have that power, it's included in my estate for estate for tax by taxable estate for estate tax purposes at my death. The life in, the retirement plan falls into that category. Basically, again, my characterization: the passing of, of wealth as a result of the death of the decedent is going to result. It's going to be included in that taxable estate. Thank you. Someone in the back, sir. Well, okay, so the question is, what if there's no will? And I guess the question I would ask you is, what do we have for assets, right? So we go back to what Paul was just saying, what wealth is being transferred? You don't have to have a will. 
someone has to get it. And there is a statute which specifically addresses the order in which um, uh, assets are transferred. So if you are married and you have no children, it goes to your spouse. If you are married and have children with that spouse, and then the spouse gets the first 100,000 and then it splits 50-50. So, and it goes further on and further on, depending on who you have. The library will be closing in 30 Yes, sir. Yeah, I, it may relate a little bit to what he said. And I, I'm not sure I have the right term. A holograph will? Not recognized in Connecticut. Okay. No. Could you repeat the question, please, Paul? Uh, uh, the question uh, is a holograph will. A holograph will, yeah. Which is basically a letter. A handwritten. Right. Yeah. A handwritten letter. No. Now, it, you can have a handwritten will. Yeah. Okay. But, but for a document to be valid as a will in Connecticut, it's, it's got to be one in writing, and two, it has to be signed by the person whose will it is, but it also has to be witnessed by two separate, two witnesses. Okay, so if I'm in the hospital and I got maybe two days left and no time to get to the lawyer, I Call can just uh, the lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> the lawyer the charges. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can, you can write it up. It, and and okay. actually, in terms of the war stories, um, I, I had uh, a matter, I did not, I, I had done a will for a gentleman, and um, whatever the will says doesn't matter. Uh, he died, and then uh, the, the will, what was presented to the court as his last will was before the court and it was being contested. It was not the will that I had done. I, had, I sort of said next to last on the will that I did for him. So, uh, but it, what it was, uh, was he was in the emergency room in the hospital uh, with his, his son was there. I think his son probably knew what the will that I did <laughs> said. <laughs> and so it's sort of like, I, mean, I always thought that the Gettysburg Address was written on the back of an envelope. Well, this was sort of like the will written on the back of an envelope. <coughs> Where basically the you know, the guy wrote out and said he left everything to his son, and they got a couple of people in the emergency room to sign as witnesses, said it was his will, and that's what was before the court. Um, and that certainly, technically, uh, would be, be valid as as a testamentary document. You know, the problem with that kind of thing, which the judge will tell you, and I think you know, is sometimes they're inartfully written, so people can't always understand what the testator really wanted to have happen, but um, you could, it's, that's, that's perfectly valid. It's the, it's the unwitnessed written will that doesn't work. Uh, yes, sir. Can you have uh, co-executors? Absolutely. Can uh, the repeat the question, is, please. Can you have co-executors? And the answer is absolutely. You have a choice, though, of requiring your co-executors to act jointly all the time. In other words, they both have to sign the checks, make the decisions, or you, that's uh, acting jointly, or joint and several, which means that one or both have the ability to act. But you can certainly have co-executors. What was the second joint in something? Several. Joint and several, okay. <coughs> yeah, you may go. So, uh, and the question of co-executors, which often happens, um, if you don't say anything, it's named, you know, yep. Marianne and Paul, as co-executors, either of us can act independent of the other. Right. That's the default. Um, and if you say, well, they have to agree together, um, <coughs> to then, then it, it, and that can it can pose a problem uh, in the context of if if we have to agree and one of us doesn't, we, we you've got veto power. That's one thing. The, the other choice with co-executors is that. Um, I ask clients, well, why do you want to have co-executors? And, um, and sometimes it's because they work really well together and somebody does the books and somebody cleans out the house. Uh, but, but if there's some tension between the parties, it may not be a good idea. Uh, I also make the general observation for those of us who've ever sat on a committee uh, that you know, the more people in the decision-making process, the more difficult it is sometimes to reach a decision. Yes. I'm wondering if someone could speak to how to choose an executor, um, how to go about it, and also I just wanted to relay that I talked to someone recently and he discovered after 
his friend's death that he was the executor. And I wondered how common that was. I thought an executor was kind of planned out. But um, <coughs> I'm wondering, do they get paid? How do, how do they get chosen? Kind of thing. Marianne or Paul? Uh, well, there are a lot, of, a lot of pieces to that question. Yes. So the first one is, so we'll just try to dissect it. The first question is, how do you pick an executor? And it's really a personal decision. Who do you believe is going to be able to take care of your affairs and make sure that the individuals get what they're supposed to get? So that's a personal decision. You don't have to let that person know because, I don't know, frankly, you could change your mind, right? You could draft a new will. And so if my mother picked me and she told me she picked me and then afterwards she picked my brother, you know, like she doesn't have to let me know that because then I'm thinking, well, what, what happened? So you don't have to let somebody know that they're the executor, but you certainly, I think Don and Paul and I could certainly say, please make sure you trust that person. Please make sure that it's somebody who is very trustworthy with your money. <coughs> so you typically pay them? They, in your repeat will, the, repeat the question, okay, please. Can, does an exec, can an executor get paid? And there are uh, two ways. One is your will can certainly say that the executor can be paid. And two, I, I think that Paul and I would tell any client that we have an executor who comes to us, just keep track of your time. Because an executor can, you can ask the probate court um, to approve a fee. I would just weigh in on the uh, who to, how to choose an executor. Um, it doesn't have to be a lawyer, it doesn't no. have to be an accountant, it doesn't have to be an investment person. Yep. I tell clients that the qualities that you should look for in, in, in any fiduciary capacity, but certainly an executor, is a good judgment and common sense. Because that person is going to recognize what they don't know and get the advice that they need from the professionals that are able to provide it. Um, and, and if there's someone who knows it all, that clearly is the person you don't want. <laughs> <laughs> are there other questions? Yes, sir, in the back. I, I wanted to know what happens if a grandparent, say, has co-signed a student loan uh -huh. for a child, for a grandchild, and then the grandparent dies. Is that uh, co-signing, is that considered a gift at that time? How does that get handled in settlement savings? Uh, having children in college. Would you repeat the question, okay, please? So <laughs> although my grand, my parents did not co-sign a loan, but the question has to do with if a grandparent or somebody co-signs a student loan for someone, a grandchild, let's say, what happens when the grandparent passes? So <clears throat> it may not be a gift. It's going to depend on what kind of loan. If it's a parent plus loan, a private loan. I got to tell you, it's certainly possible that the institution, if the child does not have the ability to pay, could make a claim against the estate for payment of the loan. That's, that's really treacherous waters. Yeah, and so it really if, is. if you're the grandparent or, or you're thinking about it, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, really understand that you may be liable, forgetting whether you die, like, right. when you die, you, you may be liable for the full amount. Yeah. And, and uh, be prepared to uh, deal with that. I mean, it, it's, it's a nice, it's a great thing to do and to help the grandchild and, and whatever, but there's a liability. Uh, when you put your signature on something, there's a consequence. Sure. Uh, you said it depends on the type of loan, and you use the example of a private plus loan. Is that different from a federal? Yes. Repeat the question, please. So he was asking uh, about the different types of loans that are available to pay for college. And there are the Sally Mae, the federally backed loans. There are private loans. You can go to a <coughs> bank for a loan. And generally, the ones that are private loans have the more onerous conditions. Okay. Right, really, you got to go back to what does the document say? Okay. Thank you. Uh, just one other thing on that. It affects your credit rating. Yes. If, if you know you you, you, you sign the loan, you, you think it's my grand my granddaughter or grandson has borrowed that money. Well, it, you borrowed it too, mm -hmm. and so when they miss a payment, it shows up on your credit report. Yes, sir. In the back. You. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. I don't know if you're dealing with it in a future session, but uh, would, would you be addressing the topic if you have an only an only child? 
you're estranged from that child. Will you be addressing that at some point in the future? Is that your next one, the estate planning one? With regard to estate planning, sir? Yes. Uh, yes, we, the, quest, the question was, will be, we be addressing uh, having a person having one child who's estranged from that person, and will we be addressing it in a, a state planning session? And the answer is yes. That's the next session, and that's uh, on October 4th, Wednesday, October 4th, in this room. So, yes, sir. Oh, you, that, that gentleman, and then you next, man. Hey. Yes, sir. So, uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, is yeah. that true for any account, financial account with beneficiaries that would not go through probate? It, it doesn't, it, it's could, not under the direct control. Paul, could the, you repeat the question oh, so everybody, the, yeah. The question is, is please. Could, was the, the life insurance policy with the name beneficiary does not go through probate? Mm -hmm. And the answer is it doesn't. And, and, or, or the pension plan that we spoke about before with the name beneficiary. Or the joint bank account. Uh, the joint real estate, <coughs> the, the, the probate court doesn't decide who is the beneficiary, who gets that money. The determination of who the beneficiary is, is the beneficiary designation that the insurance company says is a valid beneficiary designation, therefore gets paid to Mary Ann or it gets paid to whatever. But, but the passing of the asset is outside the jurisdiction of the probate court. But the existence of the asset and the passing of the value, the passing of wealth, gets reported on the Connecticut and federal estate tax returns. They get filed with the appropriate authorities. So they're part of the taxable estate. The greater, um, you know, you get a, a, the center of things are the assets that are solely na in the decedent's name alone. And then the outer circle has got all these other things. That, the pension plan, the life insurance, the joint assets, the joint account, a transfer on debt. I think, were you, were you asking about like a Webster bank account that had $20,000 in it and you just, when you first did it, you, you set up a beneficiary? Well, or there wasn't a beneficiary set up. Okay, so I think what he what he's asking about is not a life insurance policy, but just to be uh, essentially like a deposit of account. Where you said this goes to this person. Right, right. But the will says it goes to the three children. Right. They get it, it's not going to. They've established a beneficiary prior to dying. And right. So there's the a conflict between well, the will and repeat, whatever you told well, the Repeat the question, okay. Dan, just so everybody can hear. I don't think everybody can. Sure. So I think what he's asking is if you, if you have a, a, a bank account with Webster Bank and you said to them, pay it to Mary Ann, but my will said I want all of the money in my Webster account to go to Paul. And the will doesn't trump the beneficiary designation. Right. Yeah, there real. you go. <laughs> so I get it and not fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the way. We, 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 we litigate that. <laughs> Don Neville. Be careful of the advice because it came from the recipient. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I had a question um, with an estate where the assets are a little, financial assets are a little more complex. Um, take, for example, a situation where the uh, deceased person had a deferred comp plan that they're being paid out for a number of years in the future. And they were the executor of the estate and they needed to distribute to the decedent's three children um, after all obligations are paid out of the estate. What happens with that future income stream and the subsequent income tax liability that has to be paid in future years? Is there some way that you hold back a certain amount of the assets in the estate for future distribution? Please, yeah. Your, your, your question is, deals with deferred compensation. Yes. It's payable to the estate as opposed to. Correct. It will right. never. And, 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 and when the deferred compensation is collected, is paid, the estate, it generates an income tax liability. Right. So the income tax has got to be paid, and you've got. Hmm. The beneficiaries of the estate. Right. I have that situation. I'm currently settling my brother's estate. Well, I don't want to know about your brother's estate. No, but, 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 but it's eight but, more years yeah, of future right. income but, but, stream. But, you know, it, it, and I don't, I, one of the things that one might do, and I don't know whether it would be successful or not, but we, to, co to contact uh, the company that's paying the deferred compensation and see if, it, if, if the income flow can be assigned 
to their satisfaction. And if it can't, then you probably would continue to serve in a fiduciary capacity until the final installments and deferred compensation are, are paid out. But usually those have you know, some terminable life and, it, and it's gonna be three more years, five more years, whatever it may be. Right. But, but in that situation, would I, as an executive, be able to hold back a small percentage of assets that you know, will not be distributed until such time as future legal and accounting expenses are paid to the uh, associate with the future filing of tax returns for that income stream? So, so the, the question is, if you've got this estate for whatever reason it's going to continue for a longer period of time, uh, can you retain in the estate <laughs> Uh, a reserve in effect to pay future expenses, although you want to distribute the bulk of what you have at this point to the beneficiaries. And the answer is yes, you can, and, and it can reserve you know, a, a reasonable amount and to be determined in the first instance by you as to you know, what's going to give you a comfort level. Uh, it may ultimately be uh, get the sanction of it from the court when you file an account or a financial report with the court. And I'm sure the beneficiaries, well, I'm not sure about any beneficiaries, but, but they probably would understand. You could certainly keep a reserve often where we have uh, an estate where there may be uh, an unresolved claim or the pending litigation or, you know, we haven't yet been able to figure out what to deal with the property in Maine. You know, we, we take a reserve as a fiduciary, as the executive administrator, um, it be, it's my general advice to clients is you don't want to keep more than you have to because you have uh, one, a disgruntled beneficiary who really wants to spend their money, but two, you're also at risk uh, in terms of just having lost investment opportunities or whatever. But you can keep the reserve, it's appropriate. Um, you know, your job really is to address all of those issues. So is not that something that should be addressed through the probate courts too? At the time where you're ready to distribute the bulk of the well, asset? I mean, I, is that something that would need to be approved by the probate? It's a combination of the beneficiaries and the court. I, I tell clients, you know, you haven't done anybody a favor when you name them executor of your estate. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's, it's not a reward, you know? Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I was going to defer to his honor. The question is, do probate courts in all states work the same? And the answer is no. They do not. Are there probate courts in every state? There are, for example, in Massachusetts, they operate on a county court system, and the probate court and the family court are actually the same. So you go before the family court or divorce judge is the same judge that they have for probate. So every state clearly has to have a manner in which assets are transferred, but each state has decided they have a, a, a constitution, they have legislation that empowers judges, and so everyone is different. Okay, because I may be here now and intend to be here when I pass, but that is probably not gonna be the case because the kids are out of state and I may end up there, so uh, in other words, I only Well, the only, I, I, I believe you, okay, yeah. but I just want everyone to understand if you have a will that is validly executed in Connecticut, it is going to be honored by any state that you move to. You don't have to just because you moved to Florida have to create a new will. If you bring your, your will that you created in Connecticut, yeah. uh, you, it will be honored. And it'll be somewhere. Just one, one point, ma'am. Um, with regard to what Attorney Sharon said, it would also be wise if you move to another state to bring your will to an attorney in that state and let him or her look at it to make sure it's valid and let, let that attorney help you. Right. Yes. So I have a, a, a will that has been updated. Now I make a change and I cross one of the executors out. Oh, because <laughs> like, it, like you've actually handwritten like you've written over your it's typed in it's all duly executed witness can i now cross them out because i'm understanding that might be complicated my one kid is so 
answer, yeah, yeah, repeat the question. Yeah. So my, my, my understanding of your question is you have a will, you name me as executor, and you're moving to Florida, so you cross out my name and put in Marianne's. Right. So that's not going to work. Right. Okay? That, that was the I, I mean, you know, if they, if they can read the original <laughs> document, that's what's going to count. The, the obliteration or the cross outs, you know, all you've done is created a problem and a good job for a lawyer. For Don, <laughs> for Don Neville. <laughs> so, uh, yes, ma'am, in the back. Since you just said that you're not doing anybody a favor making them an executor, <laughs> I said can that. you get your lawyer to be the executor? You can hire your lawyer to be the executor. Answer, you want to repeat the question um, and answer? You know, I, can the lawyer be the executor? And the answer is yes, And but there's qualifications to that. I mean, you know, is that the right choice for you? For some people who may not have family, for some people who have a relationship with their attorney, it seems to be the right choice. Um, I think all of us, would certainly advocate that a family member or somebody who um, you trust who can work with the lawyer is probably the best choice. But I think each one of us has certainly, as attorneys, have served in the capacity as an executor. Okay. We can take a couple more questions and then I'm, I'm being signaled that we have to wind it up. I really appreciate everyone in the room. These are excellent questions. Um, yes, ma'am. So uh, she was asking about assets that have an undetermined value and where do you put that on the inventory? And I think as Paul had said, you identify it as undetermined. And at a later point in time, when the settlement comes or the trial and the verdict come in, okay, we're talking about a personal injury settlement, let's just say, um, then you amend your inventory to reflect what that value is. But it could take years. It could. And just as that woman said, her state sounds like she's going to have an estate open for eight years. That's unusual, but certainly estates have been open. Yeah. Or we can close the estate, mm -hmm. and then the court can administratively reopen an estate for an after-acquired asset, or you know, depending on what the circumstances. Sure. Or an after-discovered asset yep. sometimes. You know, yep. I've been involved in a situation where uh, the estate's not closed totally, but the executor uh, thought they had everything in the estate, they filed the tax returns, they've done whatever, and it turns out that the decedent had a significant holding in a local company, a, a lot of shares of a local company, and they were held in direct registration form, so there wasn't a stock certificate, it didn't show up on a brokerage account, uh, and for reasons that I'm not sure I totally understand, the executor didn't find out about it until more than two years after the person died. And, and the asset was worth over $2 million. It was very good to find out about it. <laughs> but at that point, you know, it's sort of things are, you know, to file a supplemental inventory, pick up, you know, what, what it was, and, and, you know, sort of have to file amended tax returns. There's a lot of work involved, mm -hmm. but it's well worth it. One thing that we didn't mention, and, I, and I'm going to stick my two cents in on this one. Marianne was saying, you know, I died, I only have a car, but I have a will. Um, and so the will gets filed with the court, but the court doesn't formally probate. Right. But the court is the repository for that document, and it's there. And so seven or eight years later, after I die, and it turns out that they find out that uh, I inherited, I had some land in Canaan that I, my kids never knew I had, but I out of this family, or whatever it might be, then that will, at that point, would we would be available to be probated, so that whatever assets I had that turned out were in my name alone could be be distributed pursuant to my wishes, as expressed in the will. Um, with that, I'm sorry we don't have any more time. I want to thank you all for coming. It was standing room only. You did a great job. Thank you.
Thank you, guys. Yeah. You did a great job. I think it worked.